एवरीवन इन दिस स्पेशल एपिसोड आई डिस्कस वाई इंडियन स्टॉक मार्केट मेक करेक्ट इन द नियर फ्यूचर द नियर फ्यूचर इन कॉन्टेक्स कुड बी फ्यू डेज अ वीक मे बी फ्यू मंथ इट कुड बी अ स्लो ग्राइंड ऑल्सो This is data that RBI released in March of 2024. Optimism is nearly at a hundred percent level. Seeing this data makes you feel good and makes you spend. That kicks a consumption cycle in the economy, which is good for the economy in general. But this consumption has to be backed by a real solid economy also. Just like US and Europe, India's debt to GDP ratio has been increasing continuously. It has touched a level of 39 percent as of third quarter of financial year 24. The interim budget released just before the election actually showed reduced government spending but continued increase in capital expenditure. Now we need to see what the actual budget will contain, whether this trend will continue, government will be cautious but increase the capital expenditure, or things will change, especially because there is a coalition government now. The first of the ten points is about elections. Lok Sabha is done. Coalition is a daily reality. Besides the two bigger coalition partner, no ally seems to be happy right now. In fact, most internal party leaders also who did not get the post of their choice, they also seem to be very unhappy. Several states after the elections like UP are looking really fragile. Two key questions at this juncture: Is the central government at risk? Is any state government at risk? Especially states like Maharashtra. If the answer to any of these questions becomes a yes in the near future. There could be a 10 to 20 percent crash in the stock market with ease. One more aspect is elections are still not over. There are upcoming elections. Haryana and Maharashtra, two important states for the current government, will vote for their local government, their chief minister, in November of 24. Not very far off. One more big significance of these elections is the state governments also decide the Rajya Sabha composition. So, for example, Maharashtra will send 19 members to the Rajya Sabha when it's due. That is nearly seven and a half percent of Rajya Sabha's composition. So to make sure that the bills passed by Lok Sabha are passed by Rajya Sabha also, the government needs certain seats, which is majority of 250 in Rajya Sabha also. These two are not the only ones. Jharkhand and Delhi vote in January and February of next year. Bihar votes in November 25. That's staggering 16 seats. The next big chunk is due in May and June of 26. Assam, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Puducherry. All these states will mean 40 percent of Rajya Sabha seats. 250 of them. Some of them are nominated. Rest come from the states. All the points I just discussed have a huge impact on the current policy and politics. One is that government's focus is on not upsetting the allies and hence saving the central government for now at least. Also, there will be a heavy focus on saving exodus of unhappy members. This is what Congress went through after the last elections. Now the question is whether the expense heads will be driven by political compulsions or what the market is actually expecting. The second one is firefighting eats up significant amount of energy, time, money. That is a significant wastage for all big ministers, including the prime minister, finance minister, home minister. Coming to the second point, job creation and retention. Pandemic-driven rally is over. There were huge job cuts during pandemic. After that, there was a huge demand, which also led to salaries going through the roof. Businesses that flourished in pandemic are actually looking unsure right now. You can yourself check whether your online shopping patterns have changed since last year. Are you spending the same amount that you used to spend, say, one year or two year ago when you are working from home? There is a funding winter in startups. Very little easy money is coming in. As a result, startups are not able to offer huge salaries and huge jumps to people. While I will not attribute to AI at this moment, but still, jobs are being eliminated in thousands. US economy also is high, but it is still very, very fragile. Also, the jobs which are high in demand, which are really required for the new age economy, colleges are not producing students who are skilled in those jobs. Companies also are no longer investing into employees. For example, in IT, most of the larger companies boast 40, 50%, maybe 80% of their workforce is now AI enabled. What they have done is put people into front of computers, made them watch videos. That does not make them experts in AI or Gen AI. There are few reality checks. We are importing a lot of what we have. For example, coal. We have enough reserves of coal, yet we are importing significant amount of coal. We have so many unemployed youth also, but still we are not able to increase our production. A lot of high-end businesses, professionals, they are moving to Singapore, Dubai kind of tech havens. Make in India is happening. It's a reality, but it is gonna take time. Manufacturing has started in India, but a lot of stuff like fab manufacturing takes five, six years, ten years at times to set up the complete end-to-end -end cycle. Also, labor-intensive jobs are getting eliminated and automated. For example, to manufacture a car today, you don't need too many people. We are spending more money to get the same stuff or get the same job done. The money that remains in the hand at the end of the month is reducing for most people, despite salary hikes. At this rate, most people will have to cut their expenses, which means they'll have to stretch the money they have. less expenses less savings 
Third point is about consumption cycle. Cars, two wheelers, sales are at an all time high. No one is giving even a penny of discount. Home sales are very high. Prices are skyrocketing. Still, people are buying. Cost of production for all this is at the highest level ever, even after adjusting for inflation. Cost of finance is high 9, 9.5% for a home. 11 12 percent for a vehicle jobs and salaries are stable but they are starting to shake people are getting a little jittery right now so the question is the bull run peaking right now or is it about to peak few snapshots if you look at the auto sector nearly all top companies are at an all-time high similarly all the real estate developers are at an all-time high metals which is an important constituent of both of these sectors is at an all-time high hindustan think has just corrected a little bit in the last week or so cement if we see that top three four players they are at an all-time high all the capacity expansion that happened around 2011 12 now is in use now the feeder sectors like banking they are actually not doing that well most banks are midway they are not at all-time highs same with it which gets in the maximum dollars into the country most stocks are off their 52 week highs maximum spending power purchasing power is of the employees who are employed in the it or related sectors fourth point is about retail money getting into the stock market via sips mutual funds let's take an example suppose on a hot weekend like this long weekend we suddenly decide to go to shimla from delhi just about an hour before shimla we realize that nearly everyone is headed to shimla be it from Ludhiana, Chandigarh, some places in UP, every road is leading to Shimla at this juncture. What happens? There is a huge congestion because everyone is eyeing the same resource. As a result, what will happen? The room rates will shoot up, there will be food scarcity, there will be jams on the roads. Now suppose you weather all that, you spend the money, you are there, you enjoy your time, spend two days, three days. On Monday afternoon, you decide to head back to Delhi. What is everyone else doing? They are also going home. What will happen? All the exit roads will be choked. As a result, no one will be able to exit. You will be caught in 5-6 hours jump, which means you will have to wait for the guy in front of you to get out first and then you will get an opportunity. Now let's try and relate this to equity markets. This is Tata Investments. It is a very large company, 35,000 crores nearly. If you look at these steps, these are upper circuits and lower circuits, which means when people want to get in, the stock hits multiple upper circuits, no one is able to buy. When people want to exit, the stock hits lower circuits, no one is able to exit. It takes at times 8 to 10 lower circuits, which means value erosion of nearly 60-70% to actually get out if you want to sell. So when markets tank, these phenomena become active. For example, on 4th of June, big companies like Adani Enterprises, Power Finance Corporation, they were down 25%. A fourth of the market capitalization gone in about one hour's time since market opening. And this was only first day. When markets crash, these kind of activities may happen for several days and weeks. Now, every day will not be 25% cut, but markets can fall 50-60%. There can be multiple lower circuits. Now, let's look at four very popular, very large stocks where a lot of retail people invest. HDFC Bank in four years has literally given zero returns. Asian Paints, which is the darling of the market for decades, in four years has literally given zero returns. TCS, not four years, but in two years, no returns. HUL, same fate. The biggest consumption stock in the country has not given any return. Yes, if we zoom out five years, the returns are 36%. But 36% in 5 years is not a good return at all. This is when Nifty is making a new all-time high every day. This is a very popular new age stock got listed last year. Look at the holding patterns. Public holds directly 20%. DIAs hold 17% which is also in a way retail money only. 37% is held by public. 10% by FIIs and 52% by promoters. DII holding has been going up, which means DIs have been buying the stock on behalf of people like you and me continuously in the last 5-6 quarters. The P of this stock is 450. So if the earnings remain same, it will take 450 years for this stock to just recover its price. At the same time, Reliance P is 30, HDFC Bank's P is 18. Do you want DIIs or mutual funds to buy this stock on your behalf? Do you have a choice? The revenue numbers are increasing. But do these numbers to you look like deserving a P of 450? So as retail in this stock, what is the probability of you making money if you are a long term investor with a horizon of four to five years? Now, very interesting data. Retail adds two billion dollars worth of net new money every month in the stock markets. In the first five months of 2024, four billion dollars worth of IPOs have hit the markets. This is new issues, but this entire $4 billion does not go to retail. 
Retail would have got probably around 2 billion maybe. So out of 10 billion dollars, 2 billion has got into new IPOs. 8 billion has been invested in existing stocks which are already listed on the stock exchanges. About 10% of Indian equity is owned by retail. So the question is retail buying the same paper or the same stock higher and higher and higher? Also, is the EPS rising at the same pace as the markets? My understanding is some stocks may be growing rapidly, but in general, the entire market, all the large stocks are actually not growing at this pace. So markets are actually getting overheated and overexpensive at this juncture. Next point is about FIA influence, one of the biggest influence in the market. Big money moves the market. First, let's talk about FIA versus DIA. There is a key difference. What FIAs do is suppose they want to invest $1 billion in India. They typically would allocate the money between four fund managers, say $50 million each and ask them to manage the money over next one year, buy, sell whatever they want as per the strategy and guidelines given by the headquarters. In case of DIAs, what happens is a specific fund which has a bunch of managers gets continuous money every month. So if you have an SIP or if you are adding ad hoc, the fund keeps getting fresh money every month and that keeps getting deployed. Most of the domestic funds, mutual funds are invested anywhere between about 90 to 95 percent at any point of time. Few things about FI is they are here to make money. Economy is growing, markets are volatile and there is enough retail dumb money. I don't say it in a derogatory sense, but retail is generally called dumb money by the larger players. There is a movie also on this topic. Note that FIs are traders as well as investors. They wear both hats based upon the opportunity. So for example, if markets are really down and undervalued, they will invest for long term, but they are happy to trade both long and short to make money. One thing about FIs is their trade size is at times so large that they can change the market direction. For example, fundamentally market should go up, but if they short the markets, there is no way markets will go up in the short term, markets will fall down only. We have seen this phenomenon in HDFC Bank stock in the last one or two years where FI selling has led to HDFC Bank stock tanking continuously. This data is from money control. One element of FI trade which is often overlooked or never seen is their FNO positions. Look at May end. Their net May positions are minus 2,16,356 crores. And I saw certain reports on 4th of June that when markets were tanking, FIIs were buying and FIs sell when markets go up. You can easily make out who had the last laugh. Just 31st May, last day of the month figure was 26,451 crores negative. So don't ever think that FIs were not expecting a fall around the election results. Now let me show you a very staggering number. 1 crore 93 lakh worth of gross purchase similar value of sales in the month of June, which is till 14th of June. This is nearly 4 lakh crores worth of trades in the options market. Note that DIs typically don't use options market a lot. Now very popular number these days is FIs are selling a lot. I'll give you an example to say this is not true. Let's say in week one, FIs buy 1000 rupees and 1200 rupees worth of stock one and stock two. In week two, they buy 1100 worth of stock three and they sell stock one for 1200 after again markets have gone up. So the net sell value is 100 rupees minus, but they have made a profit of 200 rupees. So what is published is this minus 100 number that FIs are net seller. No one publishes the profit they made on the trade. Let's say in week three, they buy stock one again, more expensive. That's okay. They buy it for 1400 now. Stock two, which they bought for 1200, they sell at 1400. Stock three, which they bought at 1100, they sell for 1200. What is the net sell number? Minus 1200. Bad day, FI is net seller, but they aren't 300. I would probably call it incomplete reporting. The retail people get fooled. They see FIs are net sellers. That money is not leaving the country. That reflects in the dollar versus rupee index. So think twice before believing that FIs are exiting India.